What's up, you guys? Welcome back to the More Life Podcast, you guys. Today, we got a very special guest. Shout out to my guy, Daryl, who's a former police officer who was injured doing taking an extra shift at a nightclub. So, Daryl, what's up? Welcome to the More Life Podcast. How you doing, my man? I'm doing good. You doing Appreciate good? You Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you coming on. Okay. So, look, let's go ahead and start at the beginning. Uh, where you from? From Houston, Texas. From Houston, Houston Texas. Okay. Okay. So, look. Just tell us a little bit about you growing up. Like, uh, like who was Daryl growing up in Houston, Texas? And also, tell us a little bit about that Houston, Texas life as well. Went to private school pretty much up all the way to uh, the end of middle school. Okay. Played a little football in high school. Okay, what position? And I'm just uh offensive lineman. Okay, okay. Okay. And uh, I started out driving uh, tow trucks mm. out in the county. And that's where I converted over to law enforcement. Okay. Okay. Now, look was was law enforcement something that you uh, that you thought about going into your whole life? Because I know you know being black, law enforcement is kind of like looked down upon. So, so with law enforcement, was that something that kind of ran in the family, or was that something that you always thought about doing? Was, you, was like a little law enforcement? Because I know me like. I always thought about doing law enforcement. So it was just something that I, I naturally like, like kind of wanted to get into. I had a lot of friends that actually was uh, law enforcement, and they all kind of enticed me to, come on, man. Okay. You, know, you can make good money. It's a good career. Mm -hmm. You know, good benefits. And that's how I kind of just, one day I just went, signed up, and finished the book. And next thing you know, I was on the street. Okay, okay, okay. Now, what age was you when you became a police officer? Um, I believe I was 24, almost 25, about to be 25. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. That's what's up. That's up. All right, so for the people out there, um, Daryl's in a wheelchair. So, Daryl, what level is your injury for the people out there who don't know? Uh, it's lumbar. L1, L2. Okay. Um, got a lot of bullet fragments and nerve damages in my back, really. Okay. Um, my spine is not actually severed, but mm -hmm. I do have a lot of damage along the spinal cord edges oh. and a lot of uh, damage to the uh, nerves in my back. Okay. Okay, so is your, is your injury an incomplete injury or is it a complete injury? Um... Based on like what I talk to my therapist about mm -hmm. and what they have gotten from me, in in their eyes, it's gonna be incomplete. Okay. You know, a lot. I honestly, when I talk to a lot of people, everybody is pretty much told their injury is complete. Mm -hmm. I've actually never even met anybody that said their injury was incomplete. For real? But um, yeah, honestly. Damn. Everybody, everybody I know that I've met, as I always said, the doctor said I'll never walk again. Mm. You know what? I would say for me, a lot of people that I come across, a lot of people's injury is actually an incomplete injury. So it's kind of like the complete opposite for me. So, um, so like, uh, like people might ask me, like, uh, like, do I get like leg spasms? And I don't. And my doctor told me I don't get leg spasms because I have a complete injury. So, do you get leg spasms? Oh, yeah. I forgot one right before I got on here. Oh, for real? I get them bad. Okay. So, so for the people out there who don't know, t uh, tell us kind of what you feel when you get a a, a leg spasm. Like, like kind of like a, a sharp shooting pain that's mm. like, it's indescribable. Okay. It's like. I, it's like somebody just maybe just be like grabbing your leg and just digging into it and just thrusting down it. Okay. For like about thirty seconds, and then it's like a, like a very bad bad cramp. Okay. And then it goes away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And also for the people out there, how long have you been in a wheelchair? Uh, since October sixteenth, two thousand twenty-one. So it's on on close to about. A year and a half ish. Damn, okay, so oh, Something like that. Okay, so this is kind of fairly new for you. Then, so all this that you learned, so so everything that, so everything, you pretty much kind of like learning from the first time. Okay, 
All right, and, and I know you said you had like an L1, L2 spinal cord, um, uh, uh, spinal cord injury. So for the people out there who don't know, is that more higher up or more lower up? Uh, that's a low injury. Okay. Um, uh, pretty much, uh, you getting limited signals to the brain. Okay. Okay. So where, so where would you say on your body do you feel like where you, like, where do you stop feeling at? Cause I know for me, I'm a T10, T11. So I stop feeling like directly at the belly button. Honestly, from my head to my toe, I can feel. Oh, for real? It's like lower. It's like the feeling is not the same. Mm. Like I can feel when people rub my feet or put temperatures on my a towel on my leg that's hot. Cold. Okay. Like people rub my leg, touch my leg. I can feel all of those things. I just can't move my leg. Damn. Now I can move my quad, like my like my thighs and my quad area. Yeah. Like I'm getting um if I'm getting kind of like my um contractions in my thighs. Mm. Area. Okay. Okay, so so how did so how would you describe that your legs actually feel for you like like does it kind of feel like dead weight because you said that you can kind of feel you know like your uh like when somebody touches you or something like that so how does your legs yeah. feel like for you like like how would you describe it um now if i'm like laying over letting my legs dangle or trying to like pull myself onto the bed yeah i feel my legs like dragging dead weight Mm, when I'm okay. like just sitting up normal, like they're normal. Like if I, somebody pat me on my thigh, hit me on my leg, mm-hmm. rub my chin, like I can feel it. Okay. At okay. first, at one point I couldn't, but now I can. Okay. Okay. Now, are you doing like your physical therapy and everything? Um. Yeah, my therapist um referred me to uh one of the uh, top um, rehab companies okay. in the Houston area. Here in Moira Herman, and that's where I started off mm-hmm. uh, when I was released from the hospital. Okay, and I'm um, going back to the outpatient per, uh, part of that. Okay, okay, and also for the people out there, how did your spinal cord injury happen? Um, I suffered from a gunshot wound in my lower back. Okay, okay, so to the best of your ability, can you? Bring us through that day. Can you go ahead and start from the beginning of that day and just bring us all the way to, I would say, the end of that day. Like, to the best of your ability, try to explain it as detailed as possible. Just tell us about that night. You got the floor. I'm not going to interrupt you. You got it, my man. All right. Um, October 16, 2021. Um, I was coming back from uh, Cancun, actually, okay. off of vacation. Um, I got home, my fiance picked me up from the airport mm. and we went to a movie night with uh, actually one of my supervisors I had at their home. Okay. And after that, I went back to the house and, you know, took a nap because I had an uh, um, extra job detail out here working at a uh, club off duty. Okay. And now, was this something that you did on a regular? Yeah. This is something I do every week. Okay. Every week. Same time, same day. Okay, now um, do you get paid? Do, I, do you get paid extra to kind of work these detailed jobs? Like, like is it like extra yes. pay? Yes. Uh, okay. They actually pay you at the establishment. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's like kind of like a little side hustle for a police officer, then. Yeah, basically. Okay. All right, then. You're still in uniform, but mm-hmm. it's to make extra money. Okay. Now, now was this something that all police officers did, or was it something that just like a few of them did? Yeah, all police officers do different details, rather oh. stores, clubs, malls, different things. Okay, so it's just like the police officers that do like the football games and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so like do do like certain police officers of like certain rank get like better detail? Like uh like say if you like lower rank, do you get like the Yeah, uh, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. Trust me. I know. All right. So, um, so like, is it like certain police officers of like lower rank? Do y'all get like, uh, I would say like kind of like the crappy detail, like the clubs, and then like the higher ranking officers, like they get like the better detail, like like the like the Houston Texans games or something like that. Um, I mean, it's pretty much open to uh anybody. Okay. 
nobody gets nothing special unless you know somebody you can personally get the up on it and mm. get over it, you know. Okay. Coordinate it, you know, stuff mm. like that, yeah. Okay. Okay, cuz I know like uh, like say like uh, like say like the military for instance, like I would say like the higher ranking people got like um I wouldn't say like uh like extra dude like that, but they got to do like the good stuff like uh like maybe like the academy football games and stuff like that versus like doing like an event uh that might be at uh, like on base or something like that. You know what I mean? Like say you had to work like an extra duty something like that. So like like mm. like uh, like depending on your rank and stuff like that. So that's why I kind of asked that question. So. Yeah, um, depending on your rank, uh, okay. I mean, depending on your rank, you can get paid more money. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Okay, you so get paid more money because you're a supervisor. Okay, so how much would you typically make in a night doing like the extra duty versus versus um, your night on duty? Uh, well, it's pretty much like you kind of get it's kind of like equivalent to time and a half. Like, mm, okay, if I make. Twenty five, thirty dollars an hour on regular duty. Yeah, I'll make fifty working at something extra. Okay, fifty and uh. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So, so was you doing the extra duty? Was this like on your days off, or like mm-hmm. or, okay, okay? Yeah, days off or even after work if you got time. Okay, okay. So, so you coming back from Cancun and you got to work at extra duty that night, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so, so like, how was you feeling that day? Uh, like, was you feeling like anything weird? Was you feeling like, uh, uh like, uh, like maybe you didn't want to go to the extra duty? Like, how was you feeling? I was feeling that like all over, and my cousin actually <sighs> wanted me to stay in Cancun another night, and I was like, Nah, man, let's let's just go back because like I don't want to have to rebook a flight, stuff mm. like that. I was like, and then I don't want to leave those guys working in detail, you know, by themselves. Or sh- I was like, I'm just going to go. It's only two and a half hour detail, like, damn. easy money. Damn. 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 So you want to be, so you want to be, you know, a, a good friend made you, did yeah. you kind of leave it early? Okay, because I mean, I mean, cause like, let's yeah. be honest. Like, staying an extra night in Cancun, that actually happened to my parents. My parents actually stayed an extra night in Cancun, and, and it cost them seven hundred dollars. So I know having to to rebook things, having to get another hotel room in Cancun, you know, it, the price can add up. And you know, I ain't gonna lie, people ain't just got seven hundred dollars to be rebooking some, you know. So, so I can understand you kind of wanting to go home. So it's definitely understandable, but it's kind of crazy that somebody would, you know, say stay another night. And you know, like, cause I'm pretty sure that kind of replays in your head. Like, damn, maybe I should have kind of oh, used yeah. that credit card, or maybe I should have just stayed that extra night. You know, so trust Whatever me, I definitely understand. Was, I wish I would have done it. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. But, so, so, um, so tell us then, leading up to it then. So leading up to it, like uh, I went home after the little movie night mm-hmm. and I took a little nap and I got up out the bed and I could sit on the edge of the bed for like an extra 15, 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And my fiance was like, you just need to stay home. Like you just came back, like get somebody to fill in. And then I, I pondered on it for a little bit. Yeah. But I just like, nah, I'm going to go. And I even went, but I was a little late. But I still went. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I showed up. It was a regular night. You know, yeah. the club was, you know, normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, we ended up uh, going outside early because, you know, usually the club lets out and we kind of like direct the traffic out. Yeah. You know, people driving crazy, stuff like that. So, um, leading up to that, the club lets filled out around. About one fifty eight mm-hmm. in the morning, um, a big fight broke out. Okay, like twenty Hispanics. I don't know what happened, but a big fight broke out. Maybe something that that brewed up inside the uh, the establishment. Yeah, but um, we uh, attempted to uh, stop it, and during the course of stopping it, um, we ended up having to spray some um, CS gases on them. Okay. And you know that dispersed the uh, the big. It was almost like a riot. Okay, that oh. dispersed it. Okay, now now was this a nightclub that you worked at frequently during the extra yeah. duty? 
Okay. Yeah. Now, now we're we're like fights like this, kind of like a, a kind of like normal. Um, no, they mm. have like little, you know, one on ones or little yeah. altercations, but not like nothing like that. No, like that. okay, so this was like a like a real deal big riot then. Oh, it was a big a big thing. Like it took about it was three law enforcement, it was about ten security guards that it took to break that up. Okay. Okay. So when y'all come on the scene spraying the gas and everything, what's the crowd's reaction? Everybody dispersed. You know. Okay. Anytime you spray that, everybody gonna disperse and yeah. run off. Okay. And um, my uh, coworker, which is like you know my like my brother, mm-hmm. uh, he ended up getting sprayed with some of the gas. So we went over to his truck and he cleaned his face off and stuff like that. Okay. And it was a uh, one Hispanic male. He was in the parking lot. He was a little heavily intoxicated. Mm-hmm. He decides that he was upset about whatever happened during us breaking up the, you know, the big fight. Yeah. So uh, we asked him to like, you know, leave to leave the property. You're intoxicated. You need to get in your car, get a ride home, Uber, or whatever you need to do. He kept. He decided he wanted to go back and forth. At that point, we detained him because he was publicly intoxicated. Mm-hmm. So we detained him. Uh, during that time, we detained him. One of his other friends came out and decided they wanted to talk crazy to us because we detained his friend. Yeah. Uh, I asked him to leave. So he told me, all right, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. He started bagging up, b- broken his, you know, like clutching his pants in a mm. manner of like as if he wanted to do something. Yeah. So I kind of watched him. He walked to the back of the parking lot between the cars or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And about... Five minutes later, I hear like three, four gunshots ring off. Bang, 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 bang in the back of the parking lot. So mm. I'm like, let me go make check that out. So I scanned the area. I didn't really see nothing at the time. So I was like, I'm going to move my car up front because I have an unmarked car where I turn my police lights on to kind of disperse the crowd. Yeah. I see the Hispanic male running through the parking lot with a firearm in his hand. Mm. I also see my partner chasing after him. So at that point, I'm like, okay, my partner is chasing after him. He has a gun in his hand. Like, I need to act as a police officer. I oh. ran in between the cars. He's running behind him. I'm running towards him. He sees me. He slips and he falls into the ground, and the gun fires off like, bang, shoots the ground. Mm. He gets up. I think he drops the gun somewhere. He runs in between the cars. Me and my partner intercepted him, yeah. and we got on top of him. Okay. When we got on top of him. Um, he he tussled with us. He resisted. He didn't want to go down. We tussled with him about a good two, three minutes. Mm-hmm. Finally, get him detained. I began to pick him up by his handcuffs, and I hear like a loud explosion behind me, like about five shots, like blah 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 blah, right behind me. And it was like five loud shots, mm-hmm. and within a matter of seconds, like, I got collapsed. And I just felt like my legs were like floating in the air. And like, I don't know if I was hallucinating or what, but I kept trying to put my legs down on the ground and they kept feeling like they were floating in the air. So at that point, like I was gasping for air. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't figure out where I was hit at because I had on an out of carrier vest. So I had a lot of stuff on. Okay. Um, I ended up seeing a security guard and he asked was I all right and I asked I needed assistance and I was like yeah could you pull me over to the tree so I can open up my airway and kind of get some air Yeah. and um, I was like if you can go find my partner and tell him what's going on so he first went ran got my partner and then he came back and he drug me towards the tree because I didn't know where the shooter had went at yeah. that point um Upon me sitting on the tree, my partner ended up coming finally, and he was asking me, you all right? You need help? And I was like, I can't walk. I can't feel my legs. Like, mm-hmm. I can't breathe. Like, can you can you call up, like, ambulance or something? Yeah. And right when he asked me, when he asked me, was I okay? We hear shots go off again, like, bang, bang. And the first shot missed him. The second shot struck him in the leg, put, like, a whole size of a grape through his leg. Oh, so and, so so the shooter came back as you and him were talking. Yeah, I was talking to him, trying to guide him to getting up. Me and my other partner helped. 
I didn't even know what my other partner was. So when I finally came to realize that I was hit, that I'm shot, that I need help, I started looking for my partner. And that's when I looked over like 20 yards out. He was laying face down. He had died. Damn, bro. Sorry to hear that. And like these two, both of them are like my best friends. Like we work everything together. We do everything together. We always together 24 7. Yeah. And that same night, like, <clears throat> he, he lost him that same night. And um, uh, I asked him, my partner to, to drop an assist, assist the officer. I was like, because I don't know where the shooter's at. Yeah. Like, he was still somewhere around. We just couldn't figure out where. And at that point, he dropped the assist. And every police officer in Harris County came out to the scene. Uh, my coworkers showed up. They got us on a gurney. Took me to Herman Hospital. I stayed alert till probably we pulled into the ER ambulance entrance, and I just passed out. Yeah. Okay. When I woke up, I was on freaking life support and everything. Like that. Shit was crazy. Okay. So, what's going through your head whenever? You hear the shots ring off, and then you, you kind of, you see, you see your best friend on the ground. Like, what's going through your head? Is and also, like, are you going through any pain? Like, 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 because I know, like, a moment like that, everything kind of slows down. You know, you might, yeah. not, you might not feel all the pain that you might start feeling like afterwards after that adrenaline run off. So, so what's kind of going through your head at that moment? Because I know at the same time you kind of scared because you don't know where the shooter is at. At either You know what I mean Cause uh, Cause now y- You got a murderer Running around So So like what's going Through your head At that moment though You know what I mean Like what's going Like what's going on What was crazy was Um I was shot On that same day Four years prior what? And the first thing I thought of Like my dad And my dad Was actually killed At the same day I was I was Tempting to say My dad and someone killed my dad on that same day. And I also was shot trying to defend him. So it was like a memorial for me. The first thing I was thinking, like, is this like a dream? There's no way I got shot on the same day I got shot four years prior. Damn. So you got, so not only did you get shot the same day that you got shot four years prior, but you got shot the same day that your dad got killed. So not only is this my dad's memorial is the yeah. day that I lost everything again. Yeah. And and, and all that's kind of going through your head while you, while while you in this situation that you in because I know because like once a spinal cord injury happens, I feel like that everything really slows down and you really think about everything. In the span of a couple seconds, you know, so so it might have taken you maybe, I would say maybe a couple seconds to really think about all that stuff. When you know somebody probably thinking, looking on the outside in, like you know, like then like that probably takes you a couple minutes to really think about something like that. When in reality, you probably thought about that in the span of five seconds. All that kind of just registered through your head in a matter like that. You know what I mean? So. Okay, so when you kind of really come back to like, like, are you in any pain? Like, uh, oh yeah, I was hurting. Like this time, I this time I was hurting, especially mm. the whole ride all the way. We had got an escort. They shut down the whole interstate. And gave yeah. us a full escort to the uh, hospital. Okay, and I felt like every bump, every mm. everything, all the way there. Where's the pain at though? Like, where's the pain at on your body? My my bullet hole area still hurt. Where's the bullet hole at? Um, I, um it's in my my lower back on the right oh, side. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So it went into your back then. Mm-hmm. It went actually on the side. It went in okay. sideways. Okay. And it went in. It struck my kidney. Mm. It struck it. It damaged my gallbladder. It damaged Ooh. my intestines. It damaged my other kidney. Then it went around in my back, and like the bullet just. Lost and not bullet fragments and all everywhere. Damn. Yeah. 
So it kind of took a little minute for me to like feel the paralysis. Yeah. But I felt it like after about, I took a couple steps, grabbed my weapon, and I just collapsed. Mm. Now, had had this been the first time that you ever went through something like this in the line of duty? Because I would kind of say, even though you are working an extra shift, this is kind of, I would say that this kind of falls in the line of duty right now. You know what I mean? So, well, so like, is this your first well, type of? Technically, yeah. Technically, I was still in the line of duty because, yeah. you know, in the state of Texas, anytime you're in a uniform. Exactly. You're on duty as a police officer. Mm-hmm. You establish yourself as a police officer. So, okay. Uh, my job did take accountability of being on duty. Yeah. Um, this my first time being in a shooting. You no. Know, Mm, my okay. first time being shot in the line of duty yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, 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 throughout that whole night, did you ever get a chance to fire your weapon at all? No, I never got to fire my weapon. No. Mm, okay. So, so pretty much everything that happened really kind of just happened. I would say without, like, they pretty much just got the drop on you. Pretty much. Yeah. The guy. He caught me from when I. We caught me from behind. Yeah. Damn. Okay, so so if he came from behind, okay, so y'all got one guy in handcuffs, and then y'all start fighting and tussling with another guy, right? Correct. Mm-mm. Okay. The okay. Guy that, yeah. The guy that I was telling you about earlier that um was that was like groping himself in that manner. Yeah. It was that same guy. Oh, so he actually he actually did come back then. Damn. He come back. I guess I guess by him firing the gun in the air, he was trying to prove a point or whatnot. It yeah. ended up being that same guy. And the guy that shot me was his friend. His friend went and got a rifle out of the car and decides he's gonna defend his friend. Oh shit. Oh oh so he didn't shoot you with he he didn't shoot y'all with a hand, he shot y'all with a rifle. So it's just like an AR? Yeah, it was like an AR. Fuck. Okay, so they, okay, so a five five six then. Yeah, I'm telling you. Damn. Mm. Cause I know those those types of bullets, they they really just intended like they travel. Like they going at a high rate of velocity, so they traveling real fast and they ripping apart everything. Yeah, that was my second time <sighs> being shot with a high caliber bullet. First time I got shot with an AK forty seven. Okay. Damn. Damn, damn, damn. So you got shot with a five five six and you got shot with a seven six two. Damn. Okay, so you say you got shot in the back, so now you on your way now you on your way to the the hospital. Do you know at this point in time that your best friend is dead or or like like do you not know? Or like do you just kinda just got some like recollection of it? Like, yeah, he might be, he might not nah. be like you kind of knew? I was like, yeah, he might be. But based on what I saw, his eyes were open. And he was laying with his head laid down like that. Yeah. He wasn't moving. He wasn't gurgling. Nothing. <sighs> that, nah. Damn. I don't, nobody's going to be living like that. <sighs> Sorry. Not even that. trying to not fight yeah. or anything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was that, pretty much. Now, now, whatever happened to the guy that was in handcuffs? They caught from what they tell me. I'm not sure. They said they caught him running down the street in handcuffs. Mm. Then it was believed that they brought him into custody. And I think he, like, um, pretty much he cooperated with them. And everybody told on who the shooter was, all the okay. friends. So okay. they kind of, like, helped with the investigation. Okay. So where they was able to, you know, take him into custody at a later date. Mm, okay, so he was eventually caught then. Oh yeah, he was caught. Okay, like, probably about a month, a month later, maybe. Okay, okay. Now, now, do you know what his charges were? Because I'm pretty sure he got charged with capital murder. He got capital murder. He got attempted murder, and he had mm. uh, aggravated assault on a police officer. Okay. Now, now, has it? Has the whole court system and like legal process that went through and everything? 
Uh, no, nah, as of right now, he's just sitting in there, no bond. Okay. He, he's had a couple hearings. Okay. But um, as of oh. right now, he's just pretty much sitting in the camp. Oh, okay. All right. So y'all still waiting to go to trial then, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Damn. Okay. Okay. So so take me back to the whole when you arrived to the hospital, you in the ambulance, you know, uh, are they kind of cutting off your uniform? Like, what's going on in the ambulance? Like, kind of like take it to the ambulance. They never took anything off. They left everything on. Their main priority was to give me oxygen. Yeah. And okay. Talk to me and keep me yeah. alert. And all I remember is us going under the little tunnel into the little yeah. e- the ER area for the ambulance dock, and mm-hmm. I just passed out. And when I woke out? up, I was in the bed. I was strapped to the bed. I'm out by my arm. Yeah. And I had a tube down my throat and I had machines like all around me. Like I was on life support. And my mom was sitting right there. Mm. And my, I think my sister and probably my fiance maybe at the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, when I woke that- up, I was just upset. Yeah. I mean, understandably though. Just heavily medicated. Yeah. I was upset because they had me tied to the bed. Then I couldn't talk because I had a tube down my throat. Okay. Yeah. Saying I had a, I had a too much. Uh, uh, did you have to get a trait? A, a trait? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you just had the tube in through. Okay. Okay. Now. Yeah, just because I couldn't breathe on my own. Okay. Now, how long after the, you know, the whole incident happened? How long was it until you actually woke up? Uh, was it like the next day? Was it a few days? Was you in a coma for like a week, a month? Probably been about two days, I think. Two days? I was like kind of like sleeping. I was okay. heavily medicated. And I had like a long 13-hour 13, like 13 surgery. Mm, okay. They was attempting to save some of my organs, but they couldn't. So I probably was I probably was like out and the anesthesia for a day then just after mm-hmm. all the meds probably another day then I think I woke up probably the third day okay yeah okay when I woke up um they was to uh, when I woke up I remember my fiance was telling me about uh something about um my surgery mm-hmm. that was okay. like two days prior okay okay so she probably was just like kind of relaying information and everything Okay. Okay. Now, now, if you don't mind answering this question, what organs did they have to kind of like remove, or you know, what, what organs were they kind of like attempting to save? Um, one of my kidneys, they they attempted to save it, but I lost both because okay. they couldn't. It wouldn't stop bleeding, mm. and it was like, if we keep it in, you're not going to live. Okay. And uh, my intestines was completely split open. They had to sew it together. I had to eat through a feeding tube for about three months, mm. and um, I had I couldn't drink anything for about three months either. Damn. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so so mentally, you know, you having to, uh, uh, I would say, get food through a feeding tube. You know, not being able to drink. Like, what does that do to you mentally? Like, like, how did that really affect you? Like. That's when you really find yourself like yeah. that's when you're in a situation to where you can't it's like you're trapped and you you're in a box and you mm. can't get out of it or being on an island with no food like that's comparison to that. Yeah. Yeah, and I can kinda I can kinda relate a little bit because I know for me I had a feeding tube in my nose and since I had the yeah. trach since I had the trach I wasn't I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to drink either. So I can't remember how long was I. I can't remember how long it was, but for as long as I had the trach in, I wasn't in the feeding tube and I wasn't able to eat or drink. And I know just going through that was just pure hell. And I was just, yeah, I was, I I was so one. thirsty. Oh yeah, yeah, they gave me the little ice cube. Yup, yup, yup. The little cup with the ice, and then then, then like you get the little sponge. A little sponge yeah, and like you, sponge, you yeah, yep, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mouth, mouth was dry as hell, oh, but yeah. you see me, oh, yeah. me. What I would try to do because, 
because they said that they ain't want they ain't want let me drink none because they ain't want me to catch pneumonia in I think my lungs or something like that. So um, so so but but me I bro, I was so thirsty. What I would do is I would ask for the cup of ice and I would let the ice melt, and then I would you know what I, mean? I would sip it from there, bro, bro. Because look. Most people would never understand how that feels, just not being able to eat anything. Because even though you are getting food through the little bag, it's a it's a little bag of liquid, right? Yeah. They don't understand. Right back out. Yeah, exactly. And it's like it's like most people would never understand how that feels mentally, you know. And even like I told myself, like even when me and you talked offline, why I told you why I drink so much water. I drink so much water because I that's all I craved. Whenever I couldn't drink or eat anything, I said, man, like, bro, I was just praying. I was like, whenever I get a chance to drink something, I'm just going to just drink and eat nonstop. Like, I just want to drink so much water. That's why I cook how I cook. That's why I look up so many different recipes and I make things that I want to eat. I go out there and I think about all the things that I want to cook or I might want to eat. And I try to experience those things by cooking them because I was like, man, once I get a chance to eat again, it's like it's over. Because even though, okay, so even with the feeding tube and me not being able to drink, even when I was able to eat again, I wasn't able to eat right for almost two years. I lost so much weight because, like, even when I would eat, I would just throw it up because they told me yeah. they was like, they was like, okay, so, so for me, they had to cut me open and like literally go in there and explore. So they say, you know, when the doctor goes in there and they move around all those organs and stuff like that, it like it yeah. takes a while for you to kind of get back yeah. to being you and stuff like that. Oh. And that, and bro, every I time I would eat, throw up. I've been there I, every time I would drink, eat anything. Mm. I tried to even sneak some things with my fiance. I try to yeah. sneak a couple little swigs. Yeah. Oh, I throw it back up. Real. <laughs> you see me? I, I, I was desperate. You see me? Whenever I would like let the ice melt and I would drink the water, I never had any problems when it came to actually um, I like drinking anything. But. But like I know I didn't try to eat anything because I had because I did have the I did have the trach in my throat. So literally I got a big old tube down my throat. I got a tube in my nose. And that's kind of where I'm getting the food from. It's like I don't really remember being hungry. I just knew I was hungry. But I remember just being like extremely thirsty. Like it was just like 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 bro, it, it it mentally bro. just killed me, bro. It it, it, it like it, it really like it mentally it really puts you in, like you said, like it put, it puts you on an island with like no food, bro. It's like, like it's crazy that you kind of, I would say, like describe it like that because that's kind of how it really feels. You know what oh, I mean? So, damn, that's exactly how it is. Mm. Okay, so so when you get to the hospital and everything, how long are you actually in the hospital to the time that you're discharged? I stayed in the hospital four and a half months. In the ICU. Mm. Oh, so you was four and a half months in the ICU. Damn. Yeah. Damn, bro. I Ooh. did my whole time in ICU. Mm. Okay, so when you left the ICU, where'd you go? I went to a uh, tier. It's, it's still ran by Memorial and Herman out here, but okay. it's the uh, rehab. Okay. Okay. So the whole time where, while you're in the ICU, are you doing any type of therapy or like is OT and PT yeah. coming? Yeah, they come by the room and get you out the bed. And okay. Make you sit on the edge of the bed. And okay. Make you do a little certain thing mm -hmm. to kind of get you moving. Okay. Okay. So and then every now and then they'll take you outside, maybe. Okay. Okay. So like, at what point? Do you actually find out that you're paralyzed? Oh, like as soon as I woke up. As soon as you woke up? Yeah, like I couldn't move my leg, but I was so like inebriated from my other medication. Like, yeah. Yeah, I was like, am I going crazy? Like, I was actually hallucinating to the point of I was having like situations to where I, my mind was taking me away from the hospital but I was there the whole time mm. 
And you see, like for me, it was kind of like the same way. It was like I was I was medicated too, but it was like it was like I knew what they were doing, but it's like like why are they like doing stuff down there and I'm not feeling it. So it kind of really like like it registered to me, but it was like kind of like my mind not even wanting to really like register it. So it was kind of like an out of body experience. It was kind of like I was looking at myself from the outside, and it's like I see I see them doing things, but I'm not feeling it. And okay, so 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 who tells you that you're paralyzed? Is it a doctor or is it a family member? Um. I believe when I woke up, yeah. I was talk. I was trying to attempt to talk to my family, but I couldn't. So they gave me a notepad, and I started writing on that, like yeah. take these uh, the hand restraints off of me. That's mm-hmm. number one. Then I was like, take the tube out. Yeah. And then I remember the doctor ended up coming in the room, and he was just like, he walked in and was like, he walked to my walked up to me. My mom was standing there. He's like, yeah, you're probably never gonna walk again. Mm. Exactly what he said. Is like, that yeah, how he said it? Literally. Literally. Like, he got straight to my doctor, like, straight to the point with yeah. it. He didn't go around it. He's like, you're probably going to never walk me in based on what I'm seeing from these images. Like, there's nothing we can do surgically. You have a lot of nerve damage. So, there's no way of us really being able to tell anything, honestly, but yeah, they go based off of anatomy. Yeah. Okay, so when, so whenever he tells you this, how are you processing all this? Like, how are you feeling at that moment? It took me a long time to process because I really ain't believe it. Yeah, I never wanted to believe it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not something that you. Because really, at the end of the day, it's people that you know, I have an aunt. They told the same thing. She's walking right now. Yeah. So it's something that I never just believe. Like, mm-hmm. so I really, it's gonna really have to be shown to me that hey, this is it. Yeah. This is your life. Yeah. But I'm not. I haven't even got to the point of trying to get out of it. You know, yeah. I've been dealing with some of the medical issues. You know, yeah. now at some at some point you just have to stop focusing on hey walking and focus on how you gonna live your life. Mm-hmm. But you know, some people they can at least try. Yeah. You know, some people just give up. Like it, it's easy to just give up. Mm-hmm. Really, yeah, is. I agree with you. I agree with you because, because honestly, like you know, like I talk to people all the time, and you know, you you kind of have to go through that griefing period to where you get to the point where you be like, okay, this is gonna be my life. All right, because like you said, you ain't want to believe it, and I feel like that, you know. That's for m- most of us. You, know, you, you got to kind of go through that denial period. Like, damn, like, I can't believe that this is me. You know, and I feel like that that's how most people are. It's just like, I can't believe that this actually happened to me. Because most of us, you know, if if you don't know anybody that was paralyzed or you ain't in the medical field, nobody really knows anything about a spinal cord injury. You know, so so a lot. exactly. So for most of us, we don't honestly find out about it until we have one, and exactly. then you realize everything that comes with the spinal cord injury. And it's just like I feel like that that's something that nobody's honestly prepared for. You know, so like I said, you got to kind of go through that grieving period because now you got to take all this in, and I feel like that you know that grieving period is needed. But you don't want to get stuck there because because mm-hmm. it you can really get stuck there for a while. And I know for me, I was stuck there for almost three years. And I'm telling you, like you say, some people really just give up because it will consume you. But it's just you be in denial so much, you know, and you going through so much. It's just, you know, like you going through the whole uh like just pushing people away, you know, you, you pushing the people away that's trying to be there for you, you pushing them away so you kind of feel like that they're not there for you. And you, uh, your girl might break up with you. 
Like, it's a lot of things that you kind of go with because, you know, technically she didn't sign up for this. But, you know, like, you you would expect her to be there. But then at the same time, she ain't really signed up for this. So she don't really stay, you know. So it's just like, you, it's just a lot of stuff that come, you know. And, like, I try to tell people, too, when they come to a spinal cord injury, it doesn't just change you. It doesn't just change how your way of living. It changes your it changes your family as well. So not only are you going through something, but your family's going through something as well. You know, and I feel like that that's something that the that the person that's paralyzed doesn't realize until after. You know, and I feel like that, you know, sometimes we could be a little we could be kind of a little hard on the ones that's there for us, but you kind of don't really you really don't start appreciating it until afterwards. So Okay, so so what type of therapy are you doing while you in the ICU? Because I know I know it can't be that much. I know it's probably like little things like them like sitting you up in the bed, maybe standing like a standing frame, maybe. I know it can't be that much. So what are you doing? Yeah, it was pretty much sitting at the edge of the bed. Yeah. Um uh, like that's pretty much was it at the first part. Then when I when I transitioned yeah. To a different facility, um, they started putting me on a standing frame. Okay, you know, doing different leg exercises, stretches, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, started rolling, kind of learning how to roll a little bit. Yeah, get mobile. Okay, and uh, that was pretty much it on that. They took me outside maybe twice. Yeah. Mm. How did that feel for the first time? I mean, the first time I went outside, like, I was crying. Like, yeah. I hadn't been outside in probably about three months, maybe yeah. three, four months. Mm. I know that. Like, feeling. I cried. Like, that's, I never realized how good air feels. Yeah. Until you be inside of a building trapped in a room for four exactly. months straight. Exactly. You know, I feel like. I, I never. Yeah. I said, I never, I never realized how water feels coming out of a faucet. Mm. You can't go in a restroom and wash your hands. Like, yeah. serious. Even taking a shower. I didn't take a shower for months. And the first time I saw my family, because I couldn't see my family because they had visitation restrictions. My mom mm. got my whole family outside of the window. Oh. And um, they called me over there like I always go to this window because they got the zoo right behind the hospital and I go yeah. look at the animals. My mom called me. He's like, yeah, you're going to go look at the animals and stuff today. I look forward to stuff like that. Yeah. And um, I went to the window and I was like, who is all those people out there? My sister was like, that's your family. And they all had signs and stuff, man. Like, it took me. Like, I didn't realize how much I missed my family that much. That's what's up. That's what's up. I had some memorable moments in that place, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, that's... Those are moments that kind of stick with you, you know? Um, yeah. Because, you know, when you're in a place like that, all the people you think that's there for you, like, they I ain't going to say they turn their back on you, but they know where to be found. No, nah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um... You right. You right. Damn. <clears throat> and I feel like that that's something that, that that's something that you that I hear quite frequently is, you know, a lot of the friends that they feel like that they had, they, you know, they get to a point where they just either stop coming or don't come at all. Don't you know? come at all. Don't come at all. Like their excuses, oh, I don't want to see you in the hospital like that. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Like, mm-hmm. damn, bro, that's... they don't even understand. Yeah, yeah like... I got to a point where I accepted being alone. Mm-hmm. And and I feel like that that's one of the most that's one of the most scariest things because, like, I feel like. F- for somebody on the outside looking in, they were like, well, then how, like, how could you accept being alone? But I feel like that some people would never understand how good it actually feels. But it, but in reality, it's not really a good thing. Like, uh-huh. like I know, like for me, like, bro, I could be alone. Like, like I, I learned to be alone. 
because like I, I literally just isolated myself and I learned to be alone so like so well to to where I could be alone all day and really just enjoy myself. Enjoy yourself. Because that's when you really find yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Being alone. Exactly. Ooh, okay. So so around what around like how long was it until you actually got discharged from the hospital? Like how long was you in the hospital in total to the point where you got discharged? And what went home home? Yeah, uh huh, where you went home home. Oh. Uh well I transitioned from the hospital and I went straight to inpatient. So I was okay. gone nine months. Straight. Damn. Damn. So, and you know what? I didn't even really think about it until right now, but this is kinda like mid pandemic. It was kind of the end towards yeah, the end a little bit. Kind of like the middle, kind of almost like going towards the end, like kind of fading out, but still, like, like, still like, strict. yeah, yeah, still, yeah, still strict in the hospital. All right, because yes, no it, visitation. Oh, for like real? That. Like, visitation is limited. So I only had four visitors. Damn. Unless it was people from my job, but. Okay. I had, yeah, it was just my mom. Damn. My sister, my fiance, and my cousin. Nobody else could come. Damn. Okay. So, 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 did your coworkers come up there? Uh, they was law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. I had um a lot of my coworkers were up there because I had a law enforcement officer in my room and mm. outside my door. Okay. So, I had, a lot of them was just working their shifts up there, sitting there with me, yeah, making sure nobody came in there. Okay. Like yeah, they was law enforcement. They was they was able to sneak up there, so nobody would tell yeah. them. Right? So. Okay. Okay. Down. Some of them that were still didn't come. Mm. Now, now was it something that you expected to come that didn't come? Some mm. of your coworkers that you expected to come. Um, a lot of people I think kind of wanted to come. Okay. But it was like so strict on who I can have there and not. Yeah, okay. All right. But when yeah. I did transition to where I could have visitors, they still didn't come. Mm. Oh, it was my in my mind that they ain't even had any intentions on coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But they would call me and stuff like that. But. Yeah. Now, now, throughout the whole time that you was in the hospital. Did like the investigations come and like ask you any questions or anything about like the incident that yeah. night? Yeah, homicide investigators came up to the hospital mm. and they questioned me, asking me to look at photos, you know, identified suspects, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. I dealt with that a little bit. Okay, now was you able to identify him and everything? Um I believe the the um the shooter I was able to kind of identify him a little bit. Um, I was heavily medicated, and yeah. I kind of like remembered him mm -hmm. like a little bit, but I couldn't be like on point. Like, oh yeah, yeah, one hundred percent sure that's him. Like, I was just, I was just too heavily medicated at the time. My mind was all over the place. Okay. Okay. Okay, so at the time that you get discharged from the hospital, how was that feeling for you? And went home? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it was good, man. Um, my um, job, all law enforcement, they came up there and they gave me an escort home and it was all outside, kinda, you know, welcoming me back. That's and uh, gave me a police escort to my house. All came out, took pictures and stuff. It was cool. For real? Pretty dope. That's good. That's good, man. Damn. <sighs> okay, so so when you get home, how was that? Because I know for I know for some of us, getting home, it could be it could be the greatest feeling in the world until you realize how unaccessible your home actually is because it's not like it's not like you going to a and wheelchair accessible home because you wasn't in the wheelchair before so how was it actually going home and where do you go home to 
uh, I ended up moving out of my apartment and okay. I moved back with my mom. Okay. Uh, which our house it's not accessible, but my uh, job got a ramp and stuff built. Okay. Redid the driveway and stuff. So it got it accessible enough for me to go in and out of my room, kind of mm-hmm. squeeze in the kitchen. I can't use the bathroom, so everything has to be done in my room. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it. it. I mean, but I honestly, I was just happy to be here. Like, yeah, ain't nothing like being at home. Exactly. I don't care how unaccessible it is. Like mm-hmm. nothing like being at home. Exactly. Because I couldn't leave when I was in rehab. Like we couldn't leave off the property at all. Yeah. Like being in jail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, how do you feel like that transition was for you? You know, because I know, I know why you going through this and you're in the hospital. You can kind of feel a little comfortable. Because you're able to kind of, I would say, do what you kind of need to do. But then when you get home, it's a little, it's a little hard because it's a little bit harder to do things because it's not as accessible. So how would, how do you feel like that transition was for you mentally? Because I know for uh, me, for I me, I couldn't go upstairs. You know what I mean? And it's like my dad, he would take me upstairs and downstairs, but I know it took a lot out of him. You know, so, you know, he would kind of, you know, make little little sound, little grunts. And it's just like, you know, like that was kind of frustrating. And me and him would get into arguments and stuff like that. So I know how that can can actually be. So, so like, how was that, you know, transition for you? Because I know, you know, Man, it could be a little I, tough. It was crazy. My mom and my sister really tackled it. Um, That's what's up. Like I said, I had to end up letting my fiance go. So it was a... Uh, my um, mom and my sister had to tackle it mainly. Yeah. You know, my mom, hundred mm-hmm. percent. She became my caregiver, hundred percent. Okay. And um, I had, I was in a horrier lift coming home. Okay. I kind of finally got out of that. Like mm-hmm. that was a big independency, like getting yeah. out of that. Okay. Um, being able to, you know, I had to be on a kind of like a schedule. Yeah. Bio move, bio program, yeah. stuff like that. Like it was like almost being like a little kid. Mm-hmm. So it was something you had to get used to, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, now the whole situation with your fiance was it something that is that kind of something that you want to talk about, or is it something that you want to talk about? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Hey. Let's talk about it then. What's up? I I bet. I bet. Then let's talk about it then. Cause cause I know for I know some people are curious. You know, like they're kind of curious about, you know, how it happens, you know. So so go ahead and tell us what you want to tell us about that whole situation, about you know what what led to y'all actually breaking up. Oh man, where do I start? Uh I'm gonna take it from the top actually. Okay. Uh, two weeks two weeks before my accident, we got engaged on my birthday. Okay. At uh, my birthday party, mm-hmm. and um, I had an all black affair out here, pretty big event. Um, and everything was going good. Yeah. Uh, two weeks later, I ended up going on vacation after my birthday. I had planned with my cousin. Got back. That's when I ended up getting in my accident. Um, for I tell you, for the first four months, she really held me down, like from scraping the the scales off of my feet to brushing my hair, bathing me, mm-hmm. bio program, everything. And, you know, she wanted me to choose her or my mother. And I felt like you putting me in a real bad situation to why do I have to choose when I feel like I'm showing y'all equal amount of love. And, mm. you know, it's not about that right now. Yeah. And, you know, it's not healthy for me, but I was dealing with blood pressure. Yeah. Taking me forever to even get out of the hospital. Yeah. Steady fighting fevers, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I know as I taught, like started to decline out of uh, the hospital, being able to transition over into rehab, um, I noticed that my, she started acting kind of different. Like, not every time I would ask her, could you get this for me? Could you get that? Could you brush my hair? Could you bring food? Like, it was always, like, back talking. 
like, you know, about what she's not going to do. Like, I, I was starting to see that she wasn't doing the things she was doing before. Mm. So, you know, I was like, you know, that's understandable. I, I'm sure she's probably going through something mentally, so I have to be understandable to that. Yeah. I ended up going into rehab, and when I went into rehab, she kind of started back doing the right thing, and she started drifting off again little by little every day. And she had lost her job, you know, mm. prior to my accident. So she was frustrated about that. And she was frustrated because she couldn't find a job and things like that, that nature. So, you know, I was kind of like lenient on to the way she was acting and treating me. Yeah. So I started seeing the changes. She stopped coming as much. She got very like salty with me, you know, yelling, screaming, telling me that I'm using my disability as an excuse. Mm. I want a pity party. I want people to feel sorry for me. I started getting real bad anxiety, like, to where I couldn't breathe. She mm-hmm. started, like, not taking care of me like she used to. Okay. Not showing any emotions, like, mm. you know, talking crazy, talking reckless. Yeah. You know, like, hurting, hurting. I'm a man, but, like, hurting my feelings, like, just not giving a damn yeah. about, about nothing. Like, And, you know, one day she just broke down and was like, you know, every every day I leave here, by myself and you know I just don't know if I can do this the rest of my life be a ter- a caretaker and I just told her to get there and get get out like just get out and she left and stayed away for like a couple of weeks and one day she decides to come back and uh, it, it was just on and off on and off after that she started clubbing and drinking like everything you could think of, just you know, I never caught her like cheating or anything, but she was doing a lot of things that she didn't normally do. Yeah, and, that was know, just out of character. Yeah, people was calling me like, "Yeah, your girl, she out partying every night." You know, I'm like, you know, your whole dude in the hospital. Like, what's up with that? Mm-hmm. She's out telling people that I'm stressing her out to the point that she's to start drinking. I'm like, I barely even talk like that. Like, I barely even ask you for anything. Like, what are you talking about? Mm. She just, I wouldn't let her have her way. And she just found any reason to make me seem like I was the The problem. problem, You know, and I even tried paying for therapy, you know, know, marriage counseling, even though we weren't married. But Mm -hmm. I tried everything I could to save what we had. And she just, she did everything she could to break us apart. So yeah. one day I just decided to, like, you know, I'm going to cut my losses and, you know, yeah. um, move forward. Mm. And I took a lot of losses after that. Like, you know, I had some things taken from me that she felt like that was a get back. But, you know, I didn't. No. I took it. I took it like a grain of salt. Like, you know, yeah. I just moved on. Like, all those things can be replaced. Yeah. You know? Okay. And my health came first. And, you exactly. know, my therapist told me that if, you know, he was ever in that situation, he would focus on himself first. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I did. You know, she did a lot okay. of crazy things to me, but, you know, if you out there and you, dealt with some of the same things that I've dealt with, you know, you're not alone. That's all I can tell you. And all you can do is don't try to hold on to somebody that don't want to be held on to because at the end of the day, they're just going to come right back to you. Yeah. After all is all over, they're going to realize, like, was it worth it? No. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure she came back around. Oh, yeah. She was called last week. Mm. Now, but I ain't yeah. answering. Okay. All right. Now, I know you came on here and you know you shared your story, and I really appreciate that. But there's, there's like just one question that I have because you know you said that you wasn't alone that night. And wait, yeah. Okay. Oh, the night I got shot. Yeah. Oh. And okay, so you said you wasn't alone that night, so. 
do you do you ever feel like you you have survivor's remorse because one of your best friends didn't make it and you did make it? No. I don't have survivor's remorse because, you know, we all got our exit, we all got our entrance. Yeah. And there's nothing I could have done to, to stop mm-hmm. it. Now, I probably could have put myself in a position where I could have yeah. saved my own life and then, you know, mm-hmm. living like nothing ever happened and yeah. my coworker could have got killed mm-hmm. or I could have did my job and, yeah. you know. Okay. Okay, now, is there anything else that you would like to share? Uh, I pretty much just pretty much discussed everything that I think of I don't know you know is there anything that you probably would like to ask me but mm. you know what there there is one thing that I would that I'm kind of curious to ask you you know you said well now you said but uh you're former law enforcement well no you are law enforcement um so what how do you feel about the whole Tyree Nichols situation it was personal it was personal it was so. personal and, you know, just like, you know, a lot of law enforcement officers, they have groups that they ain't got with, certain yeah. amount of officers that they run with. Just like me and my two friends, we always work together, just us three. And mm-hmm. it can be sometimes, you can be placed in situations where, you know, people will start to rub off on you or you can find yourself in a position where you you act upon something based on something that you feel like, oh, well, that's my friend, so I'm going to just, I'm going to back them up, or I'm going to, you know, everything is about brotherhood and law enforcement. Yeah. So it could be either good, it could be bad Mm -hmm. when it comes to that, like, nobody's going to let nobody else fight alone. Yeah. And that's, you know, sometimes it gets out of hand. Mm -hmm. That's my thought on that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you feel like that the you feel like that one of the officers had something personal against him. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, and you know what? You don't. I I feel the exact same way, and I feel like I do. I, while I do feel like that it that what the other officers did was excessive, I feel like that one that one officer's personal gripe with this person led all those other officers. To be caught up in this whole situation that they got caught up in, they, but they got caught up in something. Yes, but the only thing that that I would say kind of um where where I would kind of step away from is that any one of those officers at any given moment could have stopped this situation from going further. You know yeah. what I mean, but mm-hmm. but it, but it is unfortunate that you know you got this one officer that has something personal because like even like I told my wife before they really said anything in the media about the whole him taking the picture, I said who did he take that picture and send it to? He sent that picture to somebody, so I'm pretty sure coming you know like in the coming months and you know like when they go to trial, like the text log is gonna come back out. And and we're gonna find out not only who he sent the picture to, but what was said whenever he sent the picture. So, like you said, I do feel like that it was something personal, and it's just a matter of time before it does come out. So, I just kind of wanted to ask you that question. And my man Daryl, look, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, sharing your story, telling us everything. Thank you for your service. Thank you for coming on, sharing your your story, man. And I I really appreciate it because I know that this story is gonna be heard by a lot of people and it's going to help somebody out there. Even if it helps one person out there, we did our job, man. So I appreciate you coming on, sharing your story and I hope you have a good one, my man. Thank you for coming on. Is there anything that you'd like to say? Ah, man, appreciate it. Uh, Hopefully I'll be able to, you know, give you all the million dollars worth of front of court again. Hey, I appreciate that, man. (laughs) I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on, my man. Appreciate it. All right, man. All right.